Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today, let us discuss about pulmonary edema, flash pulmonary edema, and how do they present to emergency room? What are the complications they can develop? How do we manage this type of pulmonary edema in emergency room? We'll discuss all these things. First of all, we should know pulmonary edema means it is mostly due to cardiac failure. There are two types of pulmonary edema, cardiac pulmonary edema and non-cardiac pulmonary edema. Non-cardiac pulmonary edema, typical example is ARDS. Their pulmonary edema is occurring, but cardiac failure is not there. But here what we are discussing is cardiac failure is occurring due to some reason heart is failed, whether it is systolic or diastolic dysfunction, whether it is complete or partial cardiac failure and heart is not able to pump blood from the left ventricle and the ventricle is filled with fluid. This back pressure will build up in the uh, alveoli that is also filled with fluid. Patient develops difficulty in breathing that is pulmonary edema. The fluid is accumulated in tissue and air spaces of the lung mostly due to cardiac failure that is pulmonary edema or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There are a lot of causes for left ventricular failure. So left ventricular systolic dysfunction can occur, left ventricular diastolic dysfunction can occur. Systolic dysfunction means ventricle is not able to pump blood from the uh, uh, to the systemic circulation whereas diastolic dysfunction means ventricle is not able to receive blood from the pulmonary circulation. In both this condition, patient can have fluid accumulation in the lungs. If there is a slight change in the uh, current scenario like uh, patient is having already left ventricular systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction, if there is a mild overload of fluid itself, patient can have features of fluid accumulation in the lungs. Most important cause for uh, systolic dysfunction is uh, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction. Other causes are hypertensive heart disease, valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies and uh, many drugs, alcohol, all these things can produce cardiac failure. In a patient who is having already uh, uh, an incidence of cardiac disease and cardiac failure, some conditions can trigger the acute failure. like patient is having infection, fever, sepsis, anemia, beriberi, thyrotoxicosis. They are all high output diseases. So when heart is already failed, it produces fluid overload or tachycardia, can have further failure in the uh, heart. <coughs> Cardiac arrhythmias, especially tachyarrhythmias, infective endocarditis, excessive fluid intake or uh, reduced fluid output because of kidney failure or something like that. Electrolyte imbalances, steroids and NSAIDs, they can accumulate water and salt in the body. Negative anotropic drugs like calcium channel blockers, beta blockers in higher dose started acutely. Now when we discuss about cardiac failure, we should understand what are the clinical features like patient can have fatigue, exercise intolerance, chronic dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, PND, syncopial attacks, palpitation, angina. These are the symptoms but whatever it is, the most important clinical finding of failure, heart failure is the dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea PND. If it is RV failure, patient can have fluid overload in the peripheries but if it is LV failure mostly they have uh, pulmonary edema features, chronic pulmonary edema features like dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea. Signs like pedal edema, ascites, elevated JVP, hepatic congestion, hepatosplenomegaly and bilateral basal crepitations. When we auscultate the lens you can see bilaterally we can get crepitations uh, that may be a finding of pulmonary edema. You can get bilateral crepitations in so many other conditions like you can have in pneumonia, you can have in ILD, you can have uh, crepitation without any clinical features in elderly. Whatever it is, if patient is having suspected cardiac failure and bilateral 
crepitations are there, then it is due to pulmonary edema. Now, another important terminology in pulmonary edema is scape. That is sympathetic crushing acute pulmonary edema. It is not a new disease. It is there uh, for many years. This disease is already existing, but the terms are new. This sympathetic crushing acute pulmonary edema is new. Sometimes we call it as flash pulmonary edema or we call it as hypertensive acute heart failure. When we discuss about pulmonary edema, what we should understand is there are two important types of pulmonary edema in clinically, I am talking about clinically. In one scenario, patient is having pulmonary edema with high BP. Another scenario, patient is having pulmonary edema with normal or low BP. The high BP is dangerous condition because ventricle is already failed and ventricle is not able to pump against the high pressure area. Whereas in low pressure, uh, low, low BP pulmonary edema, patient is on the safer side when we compare with scape. So why this scape occurs is because it is due to a sympathetic surge, sympathetic over activity due to decreased systemic perfusion. We know that whenever our BP is low, body will to try to activate our sympathetic activity and we can see that tachycardia is occurring, BP is slightly increasing. All these things are due to that sympathetic surge. But when there is a failure of ventricle, ventricle is unable to pump uh, to systemic circulation and systemic circulation think that there is some problem with the circulation and sympathetic activity will be uh, over driven like it will be over activated that over activated sympathetic surge can produce further complication in pulmonary edema this is called as sympathetic crushing acute pulmonary edema what we have to understand is in sympathetic crushing acute pulmonary edema, you can have tachycardia, you can have hypertension. When we compare with other types of pulmonary edema, most of the pulmonary edema patients will have hypotension and shock. Now you can see the scape features rapid onset of pulmonary edema, that is why we call it as uh, flash pulmonary edema, severe tachypnea and dyspnea, hypoxemia. And very important feature is hypertension. Systemic BP can be very high, SBP can be more than 160, MAP can be 120 and bilateral diffuse crepitations and V's can be there. Pink frothy sputum can be there in some patients. Patient can have sweating, pallor, tachycardia, agitation, altered behavior. All these things can be there and past history of scape is also very very important like pulmonary edema with high BP that is scape. Now triggers that is very important. Triggers are mainly missing of antihypertensive drugs. Whatever we see in our clinical practice the most important trigger is skipping of antihypertensives like AC inhibitors or ARBs. They are all, they are all vasodilators. Suddenly if we withdraw these drugs patient can have high BP and this uh, drug is actually started for cardiac failure, C or ARBs are started for cardiac failure. Uh, they, uh, 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 they reduce the incidence of uh, cardiac failure in a patient who is having ischemic heart disease. So that's why many patients are on AC or ARB and they can also control the BP. Suddenly if we withdraw AC or ARB from the uh, treatment regime or patient is not taking these tablets means next they will develop severe hypertension with cardiac failure and other conditions like volume overload if the patient takes a lot of water or if the patient develops uh, uh, renal failure, sympathomimetic intoxication if they take some drugs which can increase the heart rate, withdrawal especially clonidine that is also hypertensive drug, acute myocardial infarction with arrhythmias and exercise, anxiety, stress these are the important causes. So remember patient who is missing antihypertensive or patient who is having anxiety or stress. Another important condition where uh, flash pulmonary edema can occur is it is renal failure. In acute renal failure or acute on chronic renal failure with flash pulmonary edema again you can see the same finding patient can have high BP, patient can have uh, reduced urine output, patient can have pulmonary edema. Uh, that is not exactly like scape, it is the mechanism is different there patient is already having hypertension and renal failure and patient is having uh, anuria and fluid retention.
so that is the reason for flash pulmonary edema in uh, chronic renal failure or acute renal failure here the mechanism is slightly different scape another important terminology what we should understand is uh, fosp fosp is fluid overload subacute pulmonary edema it is uh, like any patient who is having cardiac failure if he takes lot of fluid or if he is not urinating because of some reasons like renal dysfunction or something like that patient can have fluid overload that also can lead to pulmonary edema you should understand the basic difference between scape and fosp that is scape means pulmonary edema plus high bp fosp means pulmonary edema with only fluid overload situation so the treatment is slightly different in scape and fosp now the investigations of choice in emergency room is we have to always do hemoglobin percent because anemia is one condition which can trigger almost all types of cardiac disorders it can aggravate cardiac failure it can aggravate uh, pulmonary edema because of fluid overload thyroid function test because hyperthyroidism can produce uh, tachyarrhythmias and cardiac failure hypothyroidism can produce diastolic dysfunction electrolyte imbalance like magnesium sodium potassium all these things are important electrolytes for cardiovascular function creatinine uh, we have to rule out uh, <coughs> renal failure now chest x ray is one important tool which can be taken immediately in emergency room bilateral diffuse non homogeneous opacities you can see in the x ray uh, differential diagnosis can be ards viral pneumonia eosinophilic pneumonia miliary tb but a patient who is having acute breathlessness with cardiomegaly bilateral uh, infiltration it has to be pulmonary edema only so clinical uh, history is very very important when we are seeing this x ray otherwise there are lot of differential diagnosis for that now point of care ultrasound in emergency room most of the er's now have ultrasound you can see the b lines here that is one of the important tool which can pick up pulmonary edema very early so we are not discussing the details of uh, b lines here but ultrasound can pick up point of care ultrasound can pick up pulmonary edema in emergency room acutely because we have differential diagnosis for acute breathlessness like we can have acute asthma we can have copd we can have uh, uh, pneumothorax tension pneumothorax pulmonary edema ard so many differential diagnosis are there but whatever uh, available tools in emergency room we, if we can pick up the diagnosis fast we can treat it fast now bnp is another important investigation in emergency room where we we are not able to find out the reason for breathlessness like a patient who is having asthma history copd history now he is coming and also having cardiac disease now he is coming with acute breathlessness we we can have both uh, exacerbation of the Uh, obstructive airway disease or cardiac failure both are possible in that situation if you want to differentiate between cardiac failure and respiratory failure bnp will be very good tool because it's an point of care investigation if bnp is elevated then it is mostly due to cardiac failure if bnp is not elevated then it is due to a, a, a respiratory disorder so bnp can be done selectively in patients who is having Uh, differential diagnosis like uh, uh, COPD, asthma, who is having cardiac failure. But uh, if uh, there is a definite case of cardiac failure, unnecessarily doing uh, BNP is not a good choice because it's a costly investigation. So we sh should try to restrict this investigation without any reason. Other investigations we can do ECG. ECG will pick up arrhythmias, ischemic changes like STT changes. TMT can be tried only if the patient is stable suppose we have a patient who is admitted uh, after uh, pulmonary edema we want to rule out an ischemic heart disease then TMT can be tried but not in emergency room echo can be done to rule out ejection fraction valvular lesions all these things but remember uh, during acute tachycardia conditions echo may not pick up proper findings we can have only partial in, uh, information from echo in emergency room USC we have already discussed focus can be done uh, to rule out uh, b lines but ultrasound abdomen can be done to rule out congestive hepatosplenomegaly to rule out congestive cardiac failure 
Now, when we have a patient who is having acute breathlessness, we all, we have to take a patient's airway, breathing, circulation, like in any other case, because uh, it can be due to asthma, it can be due to COPD, it can be due to pneumothorax, it can be due to pulmonary edema. So, before making a diagnosis, we have to uh, take the patient to emergency room, put the patient in propped up position. That is very very important. Propped up position relieves most of the respiratory symptoms because uh, uh, if we are lying down. Uh, then the posterior aspect of the chest will not be moving properly. So try to keep the patient in propped up position so that patients both anterior chest and posterior chest uh, as well as the upper part of the chest will move without any obstruction. So propped up position is the most important uh, posture to be kept in uh, to be kept for the patient. Then oxygen should be started as soon as possible. Then uh, patient can be uh, started on fentanyl that we will discuss afterwards. Fentanyl is a uh, drug which can relieve the anxiety uh, and uh, fear. We can even start morphine but when compared with uh, morphine and fentanyl, fentanyl is a better choice that is all. Now immediately we can try sublingual nitroglycerin if the BP is good. If the BP is uh, not uh, adequate, then don't try to give NTG as a first choice. NTG infusion can be started if BP is high. That also we'll discuss afterwards. The most important drug in acute emergency room, acute emergencies, uh, who is having acute pulmonary edema, due to whatever may be the reason, like diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, fluid overload, hypertensive heart disease, whatever it is. Lasix, that is frosamide, it is a diuretic. That is a choice to be given because uh, uh, if there is a good urine output, if you give a bolus uh, frosamide, bolus frosamide has got two advantages. One, it reduces BP acutely and it can remove the fluid from the lungs and it can be sent out through the kidneys. The fluid can be removed through the kidneys. But uh, uh, if the kidneys are damaged, if there is renal failure, then Lasix may not work. Okay, whatever it is, we have to give acutely uh, uh, 40 to 80 milligram IV bolus of Lasix, and depending on the BP, we can start infusion also. If the BP is uh, low, we better start the infusion protocol than giving bolus because bolus can reduce the BP acutely. Infusion will not reduce the BP acutely. Then uh, we will be discussing about uh, anotropes like noradrenaline, dopamine, dobutamine and all in hypotension. Another important strategy in any types of uh, breathlessness, asthma, COPD, uh, cardiac failure, it is NIV. Both BiPAP and CPAP as similar actions on lung. The main action of uh, uh, this NIV, non-invasive ventilation is it gives a pressurized air to the alveoli. When this pressurized air is given, they will be keeping an inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure. The alveoli which is collapsed due to fluid, which will open up and it can display, the pressure can displace the fluid in the alveoli. So the fluid in the alveoli will be removed by this pressurized ventilation, this is called as N9. That should be started for all patients who is having breathlessness nowadays. This is one of the major treatment strategy in all types of breathlessness, whether it is cardiac breathlessness or pulmonary breathlessness. Now, opioids we have discussed already. There are two important opioids we can use in emergency room. One is morphine, another one is uh, fentanyl. Both can be uh, given to relieve the anxiety and fear. There are some adverse effects for the uh, morphine when we compare with fentanyl. It can produce sometimes hypotension, bradycardia, some symptoms can be masked. Otherwise both are equally effective but some studies have shown that uh, fentanyl is a better choice than morphine, that is all. But uh, in emergency room, whatever is available to relieve the anxiety and fear, we have to give opioids because it can relieve the sympathetic overdrive in many patients. So in a escape patient like who is having sympathetic crush pulmonary edema, sympathetic overactivity is there. So if even if morphine is available, we can give 2 milligram morphine and relieve the uh, anxiety, fear, tachycardia, all these things.
But in patient who is having hypotension and bradycardia, try to avoid morphine. Now, another important uh, uh, drug that we have discussed about sublingual nitrate, first uh, slide. Sublingual nitrate can be given in any patient who is having high BP with pulmonary edema that immediately acts before we putting an IV line itself, we can give sublingual nitrate and it starts acting immediately. And we have to put an IV line at a minimum, uh, we have to put two large bar IV lines in any patient who is having uh, uh, pulmonary edema. We can start uh, nitroglycerin. It's a we know that it's a vasodilator. We know the what is the mechanism in scape here. Scape is a sympathetic overdrive activity. Sympathetic activity increases BP. So a failing heart has to pump against a high pressure iota and its branches. So if we don't dilate the iota and its branches, the failing heart will not be able to pump against that high pressure area. So whatever drug we use that has to dilate the uh, iota and peripheral circulation then only heart can pump against that. In that better choice is always NTG, nitroglycerin. So comparing with other uh, conditions where we give nitro and uh, NTG like we give NTG in patient who is having high BP, we give NTG in patient who is having coronary artery disease, they are all we give very low dose in a titrating upwards manner. But here it is a sympathetic overdrive activity where the sympathetic activity is maximum at this point, we have to reduce it fast. So we give uh, NTG in a very high dose like 1000 mcg over 2 minutes. That should be the dose and we can either continue it as 400 to 800 mi microgram per minute uh, for another 2.5 minutes as infusion. And it should be continued as 100 to 200 microgram per minute. Other alternatives are uh, nicardipine, clavidipine, enlapril, IV enlapril, captopril, and we can also try fentanyl. We have already discussed that. Any drug which has got a vasodilatory activity can be given. At present in our country only NTG is available, all other drugs what is given in these slides are not available as IV form in India. So NTG should be started who is having high BP with pulmonary edema. But the dose is very high comparing with other conditions. <coughs> now diuretics we have already discussed, initially give Lasix or Fruzamide 40 to 80 milligram if the BP is high. If the BP is low, start it as infusion. If there is you good urine output, it 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 uh, works well. If there is no urine output, then it will not work. We will have to take this patient for dialysis. So that is the difference between patient who is having pulmonary edema in renal failure and patient who is having normal kidney function. Then once you uh, put the patient on uh, uh, Lasix or Prozamide, initially it will remove the fluid from your body, but we have to add a drug that can support uh, uh, fluzamide that is spironolactone. It is a potassium sparing anti aldosterone diuretic. We know that hyperaldosteronism is a main factor for uh, fluid accumulation in patient who is having cardiac failure. So we have to add spironolactone to uh, fluzamide. We can have patient uh, like uh, drugs like uh, a fruzamide with spironolactone combination can be started. Ionotropes are started if there is hypotension. But remember, patients who is having hypotension uh, with pulmonary edema, it uh, in a way it is actually good. Uh, heart is failed, uh, heart is unable to pump against uh, systemic circulation, and since BP is low, uh, patient is not going to flash pulmonary edema. Suddenly, if you increase the BP, patient will deteriorate. So, try to increase the BP only with noradrenaline to a level of 100 millimeter of mercury with noradrenaline. If there is a reduced ejection fraction by echo or if the previous history is known that cardiac failure is existing, then we can add dobutamine to improve the pumping. Dobutamine have two actions, one in the peripheral circulation, it dilates the blood vessels in the heart it increases the pumping. So if we start dobutamine first what happens is initially there will be dilatation of the 
peripheral circulation that can reduce bp further okay so that can sometimes aggravate the problems in emergency room so never try to start dobutamine as a first line drug in a patient who is having cardiac failure with hypotension start norepinephrine uh, in a lower dose titrate upwards maintain systolic bp in 100 then start dobutamine dopamine is an alternative to noradrenaline if there is bradycardia otherwise dopamine is not a first first line choice nowadays alternative to dobutamines are mildrenone amrenone levosimentan and almost all have similar actions there is no added advantage for any of these drugs now in patient who is having cardiac failure we know that salt and water restriction is a must so salt should be restricted to gram 1 to 1.2 liter fluid restriction has to be there so that is very very important who is having cardiac failure with history of pulmonary edema now if the patient is having chronic cardiac failure cardiac disease ischemic heart disease ac inhibitors or arb should be started to reduce the uh, problems in uh, cardiac failure so you can start captopril and lapril ramipril losartan whatever drug uh, all drugs are equally effective uh, sacubitril velsartan combination is also available now so these drugs should be started to prevent remodeling of the ventricle beta blockers should not be started in patient who is having acute and severe cardiac failure but in early cardiac failure beta blockers can be tried with a titrating upward dosage because uh, one of the problem in cardiac failure is tachycardia if we can control the tachycardia with beta blockers then it uh, improves the prognosis in patients who is having cardiac failure but in acute cardiac failure beta blockers adversely affects it can reduce the uh, pumping of the heart so it is it will be dangerous to start beta blockers in higher doses in acute heart failure even if the bp is high digoxin is one drug which can improves the pumping but it has got a very narrow therapeutic index but uh, because of this nowadays we are not using digoxin in many conditions where cardiac failure is uh, having problems we are using or indication for digoxin nowadays is only for one disease that is atrial fibrillation with cardiac failure this is the only indication for digoxin nowadays but all cardiac failure it improves the cardiac function temporarily but it will not it is not it is not shown that it has altered the long term prognosis in any of the patients other than a uh, patient who is having atrial fibrillation with cardiac failure and it also got a narrow therapeutic index and it has got a lot of drug interaction with other drugs and electrolytes so it is not a very safe drug in patient who is having uh, cardiac failure but it is indicated in cardiac failure with atrial fibrillation so we have discussed about one of the important topic in emergency room every day you will be seeing uh, many patient who come with different cardiac issues cardiac failure pulmonary edema so there are different types of pulmonary edema patient who is having pulmonary edema with fluid overloaded situation patient who is having pulmonary edema with high bp patient who is having pulmonary edema with normal kidney function patient who is having pulmonary edema with uh, reduced kidney function in all these situations basic treatment remains same but depending on the bp your treatment may slightly alter that is we have discussed about scape in that bp is very high so the primary aim to uh, control the symptoms of pulmonary edema is to control the systemic bp because of sympathetic overactivity thank you